I am a, um, a transformative social worker by trade, um, and I am a person living in long-term recovery as well. And this is going to be a little discussion about what my own experience was coming out um, out of advanced um, uh, education uh, with personal knowledge of recovery, being someone in recovery, and what my clinical training was like, and then really what that, that spurred in me to do next. Um, so my hope is to provide you with um, the raw elements and guidance and resources needed to see recovery in a new way, okay? Um, and this is an ongoing um, um, story, and each of you is involved in it, okay? This is also a fusion of my own experience, my own scientific knowledge, and my own clinical practice, okay? Um, and and I, use, I use memes. Um, the, the other aspect of it is that it is a complex problem. And so for every complex problem, it's been said that there is one simple solution, and it's universally wrong. So the answer to the complexity of addiction is an equally complex answer. Um, so these are some of the objectives. Uh, I'm going to talk about what role the Collegiate Recovery Program, which I work in, has played in uh, developing recovery science. Um, and what my vision for uh, collegiate recovery and recovery science is. We're going to discuss the, the evolution of recovery science, and we're going to discuss emerging theories and definitions, and we're going to discuss the future direction of recovery science as a whole. So I was brought on, I was hired in 2016 to come down to um, Kennesaw State University and install a research component that had never been done before in collegiate recovery. Um, I had zero uh, peer-reviewed articles, and um, so it was very much a process by which we were going to figure out how to do it as we went along. And since that time, we've established the Recovery Science Research Laboratory. We've put together the Recovery Science Research Collaborative. Um, we've launched um, over 20 peer-reviewed articles, um, and uh, we've, we've produced cutting-edge theory and research. We use a truly interdisciplinary concept, and, and this is really important because um, in, in order for us to best understand, we have to take all of the moving parts that, we, that already exist, and we have to bring them together in some sort of cohesive format in order for us to best study and identify recovery. The Recovery Science Research Collaborative was born out of the idea that uh, who are the people that were doing recovery science? Who were the people that were interested in recovery science? And could we get them all together and get them in a room? And our first project was to redefine the word recovery. So uh, we flew in uh, something like 15, 16 uh, different researchers. Uh, we put them all in a room and we locked the door. Uh, we took every definition that you guys just saw and we put them up on a board. And we went through them one by one, literally word by word. Um, our second project, which uh, concluded last fall, um, was to establish the theoretical framework to launch a brand new science. So breaking off recovery science from the study of addiction. Not that the two are not interrelated, but that the study of how people get well fundamentally differs from how they became pathological. So uh, our overarching goal is to derive and promote consensus of, among recovery researchers. Um, free from funding, influence, institutions, and ideologies. That's essential. You know how many billions of dollars um, go into the treatment industry? And so if the treatment industry just defines what recovery is, guess who's going who, to who's gonna be in favor for, right? So we wanted to set up truly independent research on recovery um, that allowed us to take a step away from all of the varied interests in the field. So um, our next, we're, we're doing a collegiate recovery database as well in a four-year study, but we can talk about that some other time. So this is my experience coming out of grad school. This is, I was trying to figure out how to best explain what my experience was uh, through my clinical training being someone in recovery, right? Um, so here I am flourishing in recovery, and I'm reading all this research that is um, percent days abstinent is the outcome. And I'm thinking, is this where we want to be in the middle of a national crisis? Percent days abstinent as the qualifier of success or failure. Um, it, it, it tells us nothing about recovery. 
Um, and, it, and it certainly doesn't capture the experience of what flourishing means. So this is why we needed a separate science for recovery. So um, I'm going to give you some uh, thick theoretical stuff that's going to be a little bit hard to hold. The best way to do this is to take what you know or you think that you know about recovery and bracket it. And that's a phenomenological term. That means take it, put some brackets around it, set it aside, because this is going to be more of an experience than anything else. Okay, I'm going to walk you through some of these really complex ideas um, and hopefully um, give you the, the pieces that you need to walk out of here and see things in a different way. Uh, we're going to use social constructivism. We're going to apply critical theory. Um, we're going to talk about lived experience, and we're going to look at the existing theory and research um, that was already out there when I came into this field. So, issues within the science. There was a lack of long-term studies. Valiant had done like a long-term 50-year study. Um, few studies went beyond a year, even fewer went beyond five years, and then even fewer went beyond that. Uh, there was a lack of strength-based measures, right? So what do we measure? The lack of pathology. Well, that doesn't tell us anything really about wellness. Over-reliance on addiction science and symptom reduction, right? So how do, how do we know if we were effective? Well, because they have less symptoms than they had before. Okay, well, that's cool and all, and it's useful, but it's, it doesn't tell us a lot. Over-reliance on the use-non-use paradigm as the sole benchmark of success. It was exactly 10 years from the time that I walked into my first 12-step meeting to, the, to the, the, the first sober breath I took. 10 years, in and out. So if you were measuring that, it would have been a big failure, right? Come back in 10 years, we'll talk. There would have been no way to capture what my experience was, but I learned it piece by piece by piece by piece until I reached some sort of critical mass that really set off the entire process. The other discussion is going to be about how evidence is socially constructed and by whom. So, who has the authority to say what is? This is where we get uh, our sense of expertise from. And I'm going to introduce you to some ideas from uh, Michel Foucault, who was a postmodern philosopher, um, who talked about two things um, in particular, biopolitics and biopower. Biopolitics is the administration of biopower, right? And biopolitics basically says, uh, that expertise knowledge has the authority to, to define or say that something is what it is, right? And then what do we do as a society? We take that and we go, ooh, the experts said that. So that means that I will um, uh, internalize this into my body, into my person, into my sense of self, right? We do this all the time. Think about body image, right? Um, think about um, medical uh, expertise. Right? How do we know that something's pathological? You can't even have um, addiction if you don't have a society that values sobriety. Okay? It's not a pathology under those contexts. So the result is that we internalize this scientific knowledge uh, into our concepts of ourselves, our bodies, and our behaviors. So we say, I am pathological. Because some expert somewhere said that this was true and society agreed. So now I am a pathological person. Um, this knowledge is dispensed by authorities, uh, intersubjectively adopted by society, and it subjugates the individual, right? This is social control, 101, right? What is this, and how do you know? So this is an exercise that um, Gergen does, uh, Michael Gergen does at the Taoist Institute about social construction, okay? So what is this? So how do you know what it is? Right. You've been taught, and most of us would agree that it is something, right? It's a bottle, right? But what does that mean? How do we know, right? There is nothing inherent in it that gives it meaning. Does that make sense? It means what it means because we say it means that, and we all agree on it. Right? So, in this one right here, right? So the gods must be crazy, right? Um, it could be a sacred object if I, if I chose to worship it. It could be anything I want, a headstone, it could be a traffic cone, it could be anything, right? 
So long as we all agree on it, then we construct it as this object and we give it its meaning. So critical theory, or critical Marxist theory, or critical feminist theory. Uh, critical theory is, um, is really the discussion of systems of power, how they oppress people, um, and how to subvert those systems of power uh, in order to set people free, okay? It's about emancipation. Um, now, this is going to be, this is coded in a lot of intellectual language, okay? Um, but I will, I will I'll basically translate it for you. So addiction is basically centered under uh, the idea that somebody knows better than you what to do about your addiction, right? This is shaped under a puritanical framework of the history of our country, right? Anything that pollutes the temple is bad, right? Anything that pollutes the body, uh, anything that keeps me from being a productive person is a bad thing. Um, and that it, the, the morality that it's couched in is this kind of middle class or working class uh, kind of white male ethos. And this, a lot of this comes out of the influence of 12 Steps. Some of this sounds like I'm being really critical but, um, or, or being really negative, but I'm just giving you the deconstructive parts. So this is how we take something apart. So the power to define recovery is jointly held, often in contention, like we just saw in the last, um, in the last um, uh, uh, speaker. And um, there are uh, different sciences, organizations, agendized actors, and biopolitical establishments that all have a vested interest in defining what recovery is. Some people, that's monetary. Some people, that's their reputation. Some people, that's their best, um, their methods of doing therapy or whatever. Um, there's emergent social justice frames. We saw this with Devin's presentation, right? Now, Devin makes a good point, and, and, and Devin's um, uh, uh, a, a true social justice warrior. But what we see when we look on social media and stuff is this kind of faux social justice um, um, kind of emergence, which is really a performative act of, of social justice uh, that's more symbolic than anything else. Um, it's really problematic. So deconstruction and dialect, uh, dialectical essay was revealing um, a deep medical economic entrenchment due to the white opioid death. You know what this means? Since white people in the suburbs were dying, all of a sudden we had to bust out the expertise, the white coats, right, and offer up our insurance card to do something, right? People have been dying from addiction for a long time. Okay, um, and then all of a sudden we, we have to figure out, a, uh, we have to stop it. Well, why? Because the victims were different. Um, so there's many actors clamoring even now for the authority over the field. This has done little to curb the gross volume of death, violence, and misery than suffering that, that, that addiction has caused in society. Think about how much have we moved the needle? I mean, let's be honest. How much have we moved the needle? None. In fact, it's gotten worse. So all the energy, all the effort, all the science, everything we've done, and we've done nothing. This was my experience with textbooks on addiction, right? So I would read a textbook, and it would, it would teach me about some method or some theory um, or some aspect of it. Um, and it was all uh, couched in this reduced symptoms um, as, as the indicator of success or health. Um, and you run into this with medical doctors a lot too. So they're like, oh, well, we reduced cravings. Is this, is this recovery? It's like, well, it's an important part of it, but it's only a part of it. And that's a very difficult conversation to have with somebody who's entrenched in whatever their expertise is. Lived experience. I personally believe that the lived experience of recovery, the subjective experience of recovery, can be the thing that bridges the gap between all of the different silos of knowledge that we have around this. Okay? It can be the, the thread that um, uh, unites the field. What was missing from much of the research um, was any credible insider knowledge. So I would read this stuff and I'd go, well, a PhD with no experience wrote this based on theory that some other guy with a PhD with no experience came up with. 
Um, some of it's pretty good, okay, and some of it gets pretty close, but none of it, none of it captured the experience. Every theory or idea had parts that echoed my experience and that of my associates, right? So people that I knew in recovery, in all styles of recovery. Um, much of it was misaligned, misattributed, fundamentally misinformed. So, and I give these two examples, Rat Park and, and trauma theory, right? Trauma theory is good stuff, right? It's really, really essential. And I think that it, 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 it is shifting the clinical discourse in a way that it's needed to go in a long time. But trauma's not everybody's experience either, right? Um, Rat Park, right? Great. Yes, we need these, uh, these, these socio-ecological variables, and those are very important. We are creatures. We are, we are, we are creatures. We need to know each other and, and live in environments that support us, right? Um, but that's not the whole thing. It's a part of it. It's a piece of the puzzle. Um, and it seems like, you know, on, on social media every couple of months, Vice will run an article and be like, this scientist has found the, the cause of addiction and it's not what you think. And you read the article and you go, no, it's not what I think because it's only part of it, right? Um, so there wasn't any sort of global understanding about what any of this meant. Um, everybody was kind of sitting in their separate um, fields uh, thinking that they knew more than anybody else what was true and what wasn't, right? Or thinking that, or being endowed with authority to define what is and what wasn't. Quality of life, personal growth, emotional congruence, spiritual transcendence, sense of self, identity, existential connectedness are essential variables, but where were they in the research? Pathology, symptoms, use, non-use, quantity of use, risk behaviors, um, these kind of things were the standard measurement, right? I was fortunate though because I came into the field at a time when there was some really good established recovery knowledge and there was some emerging theory that was really, really important. Um, and when I say that I came into the field, I'm talking about 2016, so I'm not talking about a long time ago. Um, there was a pronounced bulk of uh, research on 12 steps. In fact, I hear this all the time, it drives me nuts. People say, well, 12 steps is not evidence-based. Okay, the 12 steps is one of the most well-studied um, groups on the planet. Um, there is a, a, a compendium of research. I just read a 450-page book on, uh, on 12 step groups, on the research of 12 step groups. Um, there's emerging research from PHPs and long-term continuum. So what doctors and pilots get, right? Lo and behold, when someone gets five years of step-down care that is cognizant of what those people need in particular, um, and they are uh, held accountable and well-supported through this system, um, most of them recover. And most of them recover for uh, the long, long term. Imagine that. How come we don't give um, someone who's homeless, um, the same care that we give a doctor. I mean, I don't, I don't understand this, right? We talk about addiction as if it's this really complicated thing that we just can never solve. But yet we have these pockets where people do really, really well. Why is that not the standard? The things that hold it back are really what the problems are, right? The idea that a doctor warrants more, um, um, warrants more care than an individual on the street. That's a fundamental problem. The fact that we should spend money on a doctor but not on a homeless person, that's a fundamental problem. No wonder we have the issues that we have today. So there was... Um, Emerging Research and Collegiate Recovery Programs, and I wrote a paper on this actually. I looked at the history of collegiate recovery students and the trajectories that doctors and pilots were on, and I found that there was um, a lot of overlap. And uh, consequently, you break through this threshold of like, of the like 15% barrier, right? So you have this 85% or 80, 80, 85% success rate, right? Um, 
So there were more holistic trends. Um, there was increasing technology. Um, and then there were some metrics and theories, and these are the real important ones right here. So there was recovery capital theory, which is, um, uh, comes out of um, social capital, right? And it's been perfected by people like William White, uh, John Kelly, and others. Um, Recovery-oriented systems of care, right? And social identity models of recovery. So this comes out of uh, Dr. Best's work, okay? Um, and there were highly adaptable related theories to, of identity, self-esteem, self-efficacy, spiritual, and developmental psychology. That stuff exists out there. So I didn't have to go and make it up. There was stuff out there. It just wasn't being used in this area. Discourse. Discourse is the way that we socially construct and talk about anything, right? Um, it is also a, um, a political act. It's an act of power. So discourse controls definitions. Definitions influence the way that you, the methodologies by which you consider something or study it. So in order for us to do this, we really had to look at, now that I've given you some of these pieces, right? Um, giving you some, some theory and um, giving you some ideas, and we've taken a couple of things apart. Where do we start? Well, we start with discourse, right? So let's, we had to start looking at the language of which the stuff is, is made out of. So um, defining the word recovery would open up new opportunities to allow research and data to further solidify the meaning, right? So let's expand it. Um, and let's leave it as a somewhat open question so that moving forward, researchers um, can help us to define it as it moves forward so it's a working definition, right? And let's let the data tell us what it is instead of ideologies or various interests, right? Let's let the lived experience tell us what it is. Um, we examine the impact of words and labels uh, used by individuals in recovery to describe themselves and their experiences. We examined the role of stigma and bias. Um, we did half a dozen papers on language, just language alone. Um, capturing qualitative elements of meaning using grounded theory, methodology, thematic analysis, and Delphi method. We can talk about that um, later at some point if you're interested in how we did it. Language was a big part of it, though, because we had to get down to what the coding of the matrix was, right? So what's the sequence of um, coding of the matrix around recovery? How is it described? What is it? What is the, what is the implicit meaning? Um, all of that. So this is the Recovery Science Research Collaborative's um, definition of recovery. Um, this little dot, 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 there were 15 authors on this paper. So um, <laughs> it's an individualized, intentional, dynamic, and relational process that involves sustained efforts to improve wellness. Now, this is for research purposes, um, although it can be used however you want to. But this is, this is for you. I mean, we didn't do this for ourselves. This is for the field, right? So what does this definition do? It decouples recovery in the use non use paradigm, which is the fund which has been holding us back for a long time, right? If I define success or failure based on use or non use, then I'm missing the entirety of recovery. Now, for some people, use or non use may be um, a, a factor that has to be um, involved to unlock their experience in recovery. Um, for others, that may not be true. Here's, a, here's an idea we don't know. Huh? Let's let the data tell us what is and isn't. So it allows research and data to inform what type of processes, so the pathways, the general direction, how do they improve, and the velocity at which the recovery trajectories uh, move, so the rate and growth at which people um, grow in recovery. It isolates recovery as an intentional process. This differentiates it from drift, right? Drift is a sociological phenomenon where somebody drifts away from deviant behavior as they age. Um, and uh, it also, but it also allows for natural recovery. Natural recovery being, I went to my boss, I told him I had a problem, then I went and saw um, my, uh, my church elder and, um, and I talked with my family and um, I kept it up and I got better. I didn't require any professional help whatsoever, right? 
or any aided recovery whatsoever. And it happens all the time. In fact, um, it's roughly half and a half. So there are millions of people that get better without any intervention whatsoever. I should say formal, formal, or even informal. Um, and it offers agreed upon working definition for researchers to use. So it also places recovery as a set of processes rather than an outcome. Recovery is more than an outcome. You could have asked, any, you could have asked anybody in recovery long ago, um, and they would have told you that, you know, because what would happen is you'd have an addiction scientist would do something, and they'd say, well, here's the intervention. Well, did they stay sober, right? Or did they get into recovery? This is an outcome, right? It was the end stage of a process. Well, that's not what it's like. What it's like is your life starts with recovery, and then it begins to grow and take off in all sorts of different ways. So it's far more than an outcome. Um, recovery is relational. So the main body of evidence um, exists upon this stage. And I will explain this to you. When someone is pathological, they are, um, their relationship to things in the world, including themselves and others, it deteriorates, corrodes, um, and isolates them. When they come into recovery, what happens is that their relationships um, in all areas of their life begin to improve. So their relationship with themselves, their relationship with other people, their relationships with institutions, ideas, right? My relationship to my bank account, my relationship to the sheriff's office, my relationship to my children, right? This is how I know that somebody is in recovery, because they are getting better in all of those areas. This is the main stage upon which it occurs. Um, it includes holistic wellness improvement as the chief effort, right? So what's the goal? The goal is to holistically get better over time, right? Um, recovery flows and is ever-changing. This is a dynamic process. The things that I know from my own experience is that the ways that I grow and change today are fundamentally different than the ways that I was growing and changing at year one, year two, year three, right, or whatever. So a lot's been said about language, and I won't go too far into this. Like I said, we have a half a dozen articles on this. Um, uh, you know, but these were some of the things that we had to hold as we began to look at the discourse, right? So we had to hold these things all in equal space and give them all um, uh, equal value, right? So who can use what labels, terms, and why? Medical professionals, right? What's the, what is the, what is the, the background research on the... Um, on, on what we see in the medical field. Um, certain populations reclaim pejorative language all the time as an act of self-empowerment, right? The political um, reestablishment, um, the freedom to self-identify. I am not anybody to tell anybody who should, uh, how they should, what they should call themselves, right? I think people should have that freedom. Um, stigma deeply permeates the conception, conception of recovery. This is clear in the science the journalism, the policy, and the criminal justice. This is really, this is an absent but implicit thing, okay? And they talked about it with some of the images. It goes all the way to the images. The science itself, right? If I'm just saying, okay, well, days absent is the goal, then what have I done? I've disqualified you as a human being flourishing post a pathological state, right? That is implicit bias. That's me saying, well, if I can get you sober, then we're good, right? Instead of saying, if I can get you to self-actualize, then, then that's success. And then how to counteract stigma and stuff while empowering individuals to claim their own truth. So this is an example. This is one of the first ones we did. Um, it's a, 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 a go-no-go -no -go association task. It, it, it measures the unconscious reaction to certain words paired with positive or negative terms. Uh, we also used a vignette, um, and yeah, I mean, you guys can read the study. Um, it's, uh, but basically what it showed us was that abuse, the term abuse, as in substance abuse, elicits a negative bias. So the takeaway from all of our researchers really can be summed up. This, this was hard to sum up, actually. But terms like alcoholic, addict, clean and dirty generate negative biases. So you should know this, right? You should know this. This should be knowledge that you have. 
Um, these are terms that should not be used by medical professionals, clinical specialists, journalists, and policymakers. Right? So if I'm a if I'm a, a journalist, I don't need to be stigmatizing the people that I'm talking about uh, by using languages that I know creates uh, negative biases. You, as an individual, can identify yourself however you want. Um, it's best if you use more appropriate language, such as person with a substance use disorder or a person in recovery, with the lay public. The one thing we do know is that there's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding in the world. And now, since we've done these papers, we know that there's stigma and bias that's tied up in some of this language. Um, within the 12-step communities, it's important to uphold the traditional values that create those communities. Okay? We don't go into any community and start telling them what to do. Right? That's been a fundamental problem in a lot of our society for a long time. Um, and this includes uh, self-identification. Many people that we found in a, one of our qualitative studies found that addict or alcoholic reflected a deep truth about themselves. They could not be captured in under the terms. Okay? I'm not anybody to take that away from anybody. Um, but they probably shouldn't be going out on the street corner and declaring it. Um, the truth empowers them, it allows them to reclaim negative and stigmatizing language. So, you all have seen this before, I'm sure. Uh, this was one of our most popular papers. Um, The term dialectics means um, it's a search for truth between argument and counterargument. So what is truth? What is untruth? Uh, um, uh, what, what, is, uh, what exists? What doesn't? Um, what are the things that negate what is? So now, I've given you all the pieces. Anybody feel lost? It's pretty heady stuff, I know. Um, this, I've been living it for three years, right? Um, but I'll show you why we did it. Now that we have all of the pieces, we're going to start putting this back together. Okay? If we're going to create a new science, we got to do it uh, by the book, and we got to know what the pieces are. Right? So we've taken everything out, we've set it on the floor, we've examined it, we've held it in our hands, we've weighed it. Right? So let's start putting it back together um, into a new science. So in order to organize a new science, you need the field or phenomena, right? So that's going to be recovery. Um, you need a grand theory, which is something that directs all of the things that come underneath it, right? It's not a testable theory. Um, it's, a, um, it's more of a, a, a guiding uh, idea. And then you have mid-range and micro theories. These are testable phenomena, right? So uh, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll explain a little bit here. So, these were some of the existing mid micro theories, right, which we discussed earlier. You don't have to read all this. Slides will be available. Um, but take something like recovery capital, right, that um, the full extent of personal, interpersonal, ecological, and cultural resources that can be brought to bear in an effort to overcome problematic substance use, right? It's a good idea, right? And it's measurable, just saying. Um, and so, these were the mid and micro range theories that were already existing. So we needed a grand theory. There was no grand theory for the science, right? And grand theory um, is what's gonna give us the uh, overarching uh, direction that we're gonna go. It orients the frameworks, it uh, offers up boundaries, um, it gives us the, the, uh, a place to position our inquiry onto any phenomena. So this is like psychoanalytic theory or caring theory, which is the theory of nursing. It's really, really fascinating. So this is how you would visualize a grand theory, right? So you'd have, so like, let's say you've got definitions, recovery capital, socio-ecological models, blah, 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 right? All of that is done in service of this, right? The theory of rocket flight. So this is our grand theory. Grand theory for recovery science. This is the thing under which the entire science will be organized. Successful long-term recovery is self-evident and is composed of a fundamentally emancipatory process. So, what this means is that it situates the subjective individual recovery process as the main object of study. What are we looking at? 
we're looking at individual recovery growth for any one person, right? Um, recovery and related phenomena produce results that are altogether different from non-recovery or pathological states, right? This is the self-evident nature of it, right? The person who, who I was, borrowing from my own experience, uh, living homeless on the street, smoking cocaine, is fundamentally different from the person I am today, okay? The diff distance between those two is a self-evident distance, okay? And it happened through a process uh, over time. So this means that recovery occurs through processes that begin in states of bondage and end in greater and increasing states of freedom. This can be transposed over multiple areas related to recovery. So what this does is that, you guys like Rubik's Cubes? This is one single algorithm, yes. It is one algorithm of how to um, uh, translate this to that, right? But it's a, it's a useful idea because it's only one algorithm of many. But um, it also shows you that the pathways in order to get to any ordered state may vary. It also shows you that the difference between this Rubik's Cube and this Rubik's Cube is self-evident. And it's a movement from disorder to order. This is what we talk about when we talk about a, a fundamentally emancipatory process, right? Moving towards wellness. Does that make sense? So, how do we capture it? Recovery is best captured in situ. That means as placed, right? Uh, one of the problems with, that we've run into with MAT studies is that what happens in the lab doesn't necessarily happen in the real world. And this is a fundamental problem in science, right? So when we look at recovery, probably the best way to look at it is to see where it occurs and under what conditions. Um, best way to capture it is by studying it as it occurs in the world and as it changes in the world. Uh, longitudinally, right? You don't have to worry about these equations. These are for me to remember. But like longitudinal. So the idea that my relationship with myself, my relationship with others, the ecological context under which I live, um, all measured over time. And if I was able to do that, then I would capture probably the most accurate picture of what recovery is. Um, through transformation. So what, what we see in recovery is that people will enact recovery long before they internalize it, right? So, and, but what happens is over that process, enacting recovery behaviors, they s gradually internalize that until they become a person who is in recovery as an identity, right? This occurs over time. Relationally, people, ideas, institution, belief systems, and society. What are my relationships to these things? And how have they changed? Um, this is another way we can measure it. You can also leverage um, this theory in various settings. You can leverage it into um, prevention, education, uh, programming and practice. So, this is the takeaway. Emerging research theory and ideas were required to address the major issues in the science um, around recovery. Recovery experience was not central to the science, yet it is central to the recovery process, right? People in recovery don't care what scientists say. So how come the science doesn't match what the experience is? That was one of the fundamental problems. And then recovery requires its own science as it is different, though related to addiction science. The tools to study addiction do not translate all that well to recovery. Um, so we began forming research collaborations and orienting laboratories to study recovery as its own field. I have my own lab. You have the Recovery Research Institute up at Harvard. Um, and then there's some, some other places where this is happening. Um, and so our first two major advancements for this field is to set down the groundwork for recovery science. And this is the definition and the grand theory. This should be enough of the raw pieces that we need in order to establish an entire science um, to study recovery. So future research should seek to aggregate recovery experience, 
right? So the capturing of qualitative information about what it's like to be in recovery. Because if we capture enough of it, guess what happens? We can set it all out and we'll see a pattern. And from that pattern, we can develop objective metrics, objective practices, right? Things that we know will work, derived directly from commonalities between the experience of recovery. Um, this will allow us to, to map major topographical landmarks and collective recovery experiences. Um, mixed methods, qualitative stuff, and then, of course, um, the interpersonal, interpersonal, and ecological variables. If you are looking at anything in your clients, in your people that you're working with, whatever, you should um, probably ask yourself, is there a way that I can look at at least one of these variables or track some of this information? I'm also a managing editor for the Journal, Journal of Recovery Science. Okay, I'm one of the managing editors. Um, my my uh, research partner, Robert Ashford, is the other. We have a stellar editorial team. We have William White, um, uh, John Kelly, uh, Brandon Bergman. We've got all those on our editorial board. Our goal with this journal is to be an open access journal that is low barrier. So if you're a graduate student uh, and you have a paper on recovery and you're getting turned down by the addiction journals, Right? We will literally walk you through the process, right? And you will have experts look at your paper and guide you through that. Okay? We are interested in helping people get published, particularly uh, recovery researchers get published. These are some of the other journals that we've, we've had pretty good luck with. Um, and then the rest from here on out, it's 10 slides. This is for you, okay? Um, this is all the work we've done here, here, here. These are books I recommend. These are additional references. These are sites, blogs, and podcasts. So you got everything that you need. 